This video is brought to you by Factor. The genre of religious animation is by far one of the most interesting to me. It could be something as gorgeous as Prince of Egypt, or as clever as VeggieTales, or as disturbing as Become Jehovah's Friend. Oh, by the way, I am still working on this video, believe it or not. I even went to their HQ, and I have a custom animation for the occasion. If everything goes according to plan, the video should be out by December, I hope. I know it's been like nearly three years, but trust me, it'll be worth it. But during my research for that project, I stumbled across an alleged Mormon cartoon that was apparently banned. So of course I watched it. And it was, uh, <laughs> yikes. Those who remain neutral in the battle were cursed to be born with black skin. This is the Mormon explanation for the Negro race. It is called The God Makers. And after doing some research, I discovered it wasn't from the Mormons, but against them. That Mormons hate this movie and say it is point-blank defamation of their religion. Released in 1982 and produced by Jeremiah Films and co-authored by ministers Ed Decker and Dave Hunt, The God Makers is a full-blown, controversial anti-Mormon film and features this notorious animated segment, a segment that sought to cleverly summarize and shed light on what the creators of this film perceive as the negative aspects of the Mormon religion, now known as the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. So, how well do they accomplish this task? Well, you're about to find out. According to the Book of Mormon, after his resurrection, Jesus came to the Americas to preach to the Indians, who the Mormons believe are really Israelites. But before we dive into the world of Mormons, and apparently anti-Mormons, I gotta break bread, just like Jesus. And also get bread with a quick shout out to this video's sponsor, Factor. Folks, it is summertime, but I'm still stupid busy. I'm a busy man. I got busy things to do. I'm too busy playing uh, on my phone. Bikini season is nearly upon us. I got to shed some weight in my belly, my sexy belly. Fortunately, that's where Factor has my back. You see, I'm a big guy. Fat's hard for me, but I can put on muscle, which is why I'm trying to do keto. And that's what I asked from Factor. I'm like, I need some meals that are curated to be calorie smart with around like, I'd say less than 550 calories per serving. You know, I, I, I want to make sure I'm not overeating with these meals. And that's what Factor is about. They're like, yo, we got you. These meals are curated to be calorie smart with around or less than 550 calories per serving. You know, also I, like I said, I got the keto path going on with my meals to help me get in the eating parameters I need. I got the black pepper and sage pork chop. I got the chicken piccata. I got the garlic and herb chicken breast. You know, Factor preps these meals that are tailor-made for yours truly, that's me. Plus they are fresh and never frozen and they are delivered right to your door. It is legit such a time saver. And I have to cook during the day. Instead I grab a factor meal out of the fridge and put it in the oven and boom, it's lunchtime while I watch cartoons and call it work. It's genuinely a time saver. These meals can be ready in like two minutes if you roll with the toaster oven. So head to factor75.com or click the link down below and use code SABERSPARK50 to get 50% off your first First Factor box. That is once again factor75.com or click the link down below and use code SABERSPARK50 to get 50% off. Again, I highly recommend Factor. I eat that food. I love it. Go hit them up today. All right. On that note, it's Mormon time. Thus, Lucifer became the devil and his followers the demons. Let's take a moment to learn about the groups behind the God Makers and this delightful Mormon cartoon. Jeremiah Films, the production company behind this thought-provoking documentary, was founded by Patrick Matriciana and his wife Carol, both being self-proclaimed celebrities for appearing on niche radio talk shows and being recognized as cult experts. Carol is apparently a best-selling author for her book, The Evolution Conspiracy. So, uh, <laughs> take that for what it's worth. But Jeremiah Films was their collective company known for its films, videos, books, and music that cover hard-hitting topics such as transhumanism, political corruption, specifically with the Clintons, 
terrorism. Specifically, it was organized as terrorism and Islam in the past, Christianity, prophecy, and so much more. Jeremiah would describe its work as, quote, an effective creator of hard-hitting, life-changing motion pictures. And, quote, with its cutting-edge investigations of the political world, Jeremiah Films has successfully filled the void created by the national media, whose inability to consistently present the truth to the American public has become all too common, end quote. You can explore their void-filling works, including the Godmakers, on their website and follow their presence on several social media platforms, though, do you really want to? Yeah, I don't think you do. Jeremiah Films isn't new to controversy, though. Their filmography includes works like Halloween, Trick or Treat, which delves into the darker side of Halloween. There's also, <laughs> embrace yourself, a Baby Parts for Sale, which discusses the baby parts industry. Apparently, that's an industry. And then you got Death by Entertainment, which examines the impact of the entertainment industry on society's morals. They have also tackled subjects such as AIDS, Islam, the God Consciousness Movement, evolution, and transhumanism in their films. Intriguingly, Jeremiah Films and Patrick Matriciana were involved in a notable defamation case in 1996 regarding the video Obstruction of Justice, the MENA connection. The video alleged involvement of police officers linked to former Arkansas Governor Bill Clinton in drug trafficking and murders. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, Clinton, he murdered a guy. Yeah, you know, we're not allowed, <laughs> no, to, you're not no, allowed to put out no, um, accusations without... That's police, a little darling. too that's far. The, the police officers sued for defamation, leading to a significant financial penalty, which was later overturned on appeal. So highly controversial and highly offensive was Jeremiah Films' bread and butter to get their evangelical audience on their side. All right, man, manslaughter. Now, let's focus on Ed Decker, a prominent figure in this realm, too. He was an American counterculture apologist, evangelist, and a former member of the Mormon faith. Decker's journey of questioning Mormon history and doctrine led him to reject the religion and found Saints Alive in Jesus, a counter cult's ministry. And through this ministry, where he would discuss and preach everything wrong with Mormonism, one of his most notable works he wrote was The Godmakers, a shocking expose of what the Mormon church really believes. Co-authored with Dave Hunt, another minister of his own biblical discernment church, The Marine Call. The success of this book cannot be understated, as it became a national phenomenon within evangelical circles, holding the number one spot as a Christian book in America for several months. However, Decker has faced criticism, uh, particularly from Gerald and Sandra Tanner, who accused him of misrepresentations and inaccuracies in his writings depicting the Mormon belief. Decker strongly defended his work, claiming that he could substantiate every claim with evidence from original Mormon documents. But what was actually said in his books that people had such a problem with? Well, as Decker teamed up with Jeremiah Films, more people would find out as The Godmakers became a full-fledged documentary. The documented evidence you are about to see may seem unbelievable, but it's all true. When they took my family, there wasn't anything else to live for. I tried to kill myself. Thank God I didn't succeed. The Godmakers featured interviews with representatives from the LDS Church, as well as former Mormons. Through these interviews, the film presented information on Mormonism and its alleged deceptive and dangerous nature. It delves into controversial beliefs held by Mormons, including the interpretation of symbols and the temple ceremony, and the belief that the God of the Mormon temple differed from the biblical God. Reenactments of LDS temple rituals, both for the living and the dead, were included in the documentary, some to off-putting music to show its strangeness. 
It is worth noting that some of these rituals have been modified since the film's release, but the secretive nature of these rituals has led them to be highly guarded, with potential risk for those who reveal them in the LDS church. The Godmakers found legitimacy by incorporating the endorsements of prominent individuals such as Walter Martin, director of the Christian Research Institute, and Hall Lindsey, author of The Late Great Planet Earth. Doesn't mean a lot to those outside of religious study, but their support added weight to the documentary's exploration of the negative aspects of Mormonism. And we haven't even got to how it presents itself with an ominous tone from the very beginning with an aerial shot of the LDS Church's Hawaii temple. It then shares testimonies from individuals who claim to have been negatively affected by the LDS Church, shedding light on the potential consequences faced by those who question or leave the faith. I think the most difficult part of this for me is that they have turned my own beautiful children against me. You know, the brainwashing techniques of this organization are really incredibly effective. It even features Decker approaching lawyers, proposing a class action lawsuit linking Mormonism to the occult and Satanism. Uh, basically, the Godmakers comes out swinging to knock Mormonism down a notch. That's part of the incredible deception, and that's what we have to dig into, and we need, we need to expose it, we need to open it up to the truth. Covering various aspects of Mormon theology, including the controversial belief in the progression to become gods and goddesses through strict adherence to rituals and regulations, The Godmakers explores the requirements of worthiness for the temple ceremonies, the belief in eternal marriage, and ruling over one's own planet, and the social consequences faced by those who leave the Mormon church. Those Mormons who were sealed in the eternal marriage ceremony expect to become polygamous gods in the celestial kingdom, rule over other planets, and spawn new families throughout eternity. We continue on with everything the documentary highlights. The extensive wealth and economic power of the LDS Church, the personal stories of individuals struggling with the strict standards and conflicting sexual beliefs within the Mormon Church, which are shared, the authenticity and historical validity of Mormon teachings, pointing to the lack of archaeological evidence, and the controversy surrounding the Book of Mormon's translation of the Egyptian papyrus fragments it is based on. Now, for me, as someone who was raised Baptist, it was wild seeing evangelical Christians go, hmm, how can Mormons believe this stuff? It's so ridiculous while also taking Noah's Ark at face value. Like, the irony is palpable. Well, we know it's bizarre. I, I know as a finite being, I can never become an infinite god. It's a logical absurdity. Again, it's like poetry, it's sort of they rhyme. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Every stanza kind of rhymes with the last one. Let's try and focus on the animated segment for now, as that is a lot. And just ask the question, what is Mormonism? And did the godmakers accurately depict it? The documentary includes the animated segment to depict an overview explanation of Mormon beliefs, including the belief in multiple gods ruling different planets, the story of Lucifer and Jesus, and the belief in the curse of black skin and the origin of the, and I quote the animated segment here, the Negro race. Again, yikes. It also touches on beliefs about Elohim and his goddess wife coming to earth as Adam and Eve. Also, Joseph Smith as a revered prophet, and the rigorous moral and financial requirements of Mormons. The aspiration to become gods through worthiness, along with the expectation of becoming polygamous gods in the celestial kingdom, ruling over other planets, and creating eternal families, is also presented to the audience. There's also something about Native Americans fighting like <laughs> what looks to uh, be Roman soldiers? <laughs> it's it's uh, quite the roller coaster. That all being said, the Godmakers gained tremendous popularity through this and became a national phenomenon, revolutionizing how Mormonism was perceived by the wider public. 
Or that's how Decker and Jeremiah Films depict it. The documentary's exploration of the negative aspects of Mormonism, its controversial claims, and personal testimonies resonated with many viewers. But not all in the best way, as the film faced criticism for its portrayal and lack of concrete evidence. It was lambasted by Mormons and non-Mormon critics alike, while undeniably leaving a lasting impact, forever changing the public's perception of Mormonism. Now, that was a quote from a Christian newsletter talking about the Godmaker, so take that with a grain of salt. Or if you don't want to take my word, here's some of the responses from critics. Truman G. Madsen, an LDS professor of religion and philosophy, described the Godmakers as, quote, religious pornography. Wow. The Anti-Defamation League of the, I hope I said this correctly, Benign Barith expressed concerns about the film, labeling it as Mormon bashing and invidious and defamatory. J.B. Hawes commented on the film's cartoon, which they described as presenting a distorted overview of Mormon beliefs, comparing it being treated as Greek mythology or sci-fi. And the non-denomination National Council of Christians and Jews criticized the film for its use of half-truths, faulty generalizations, sensationalism, and appeals to fear and prejudice. They found the film to be an unfair and untruthful presentation of Mormon beliefs and practices, highlighting the harmful consequences of such misrepresentations. Now, I would say that is all accurate criticism to a degree. As from editing to music cues, the film distorts and misrepresents Mormon beliefs and history, aligning it with explicit content designed to provoke rather than educate which makes it more about sensationalism rather than actually trying to create a well-constructed argument to convince. When Kip went to the LDS counselors, they only reinforced the teachings of the church, which just increased Kip's feelings of unworthiness. But convincing doesn't seem like it was the point. In the end, The Godmakers was made for a specific audience, for a specific purpose, to reaffirm evangelical Christians who already had a distaste for the Mormon faith. Like the many Christians newsletters at the time that posted ads from Ed Decker for the Godmakers that were openly hostile towards Mormons. A senior editor of Christianity Today responded to a Mormon protesting the film's ad in their paper with, quote, Dear Mr. McCary, thank you for your thoughts in response to the Ed Decker advertisement in Christianity Today. We Christians must always be charitable with one another. Yet, I must point out to you that we do not consider the Mormon church to be Christian. Its doctrinal views carry it a far distance from Orthodox Christianity. Mormonism is not, as you say in your letter, a large denomination. It is a movement unto itself, completely separate from Christian denominations." End quote. The film sets up these people to feel in the right to defend their belief by labeling Mormonism as just the other deserving of no respect. But even critics towards Mormons, like Gerald and Sandra Tanner, who initially supported the Godmakers, later criticized its overemphasis on Satan's role in Mormonism and distanced themselves from the film's portrayal. Then Ed Decker, in an interview, made his views clear, though his anti-Mormon views can be seen as extreme by some, Decker believed that the changing sociological landscape of Mormonism rendered theological arguments less relevant. He claimed to have never made any errors in his work and challenged anyone to prove otherwise. Despite his falling out with fellow anti-Mormons, Decker remained steadfast in his convictions. And while the film did not receive extensive national news coverage, like I stated, it was made to reaffirm evangelical Christian beliefs. And boy did it, as it generated heated debates in local papers, particularly in the Pacific Northwest and California. The controversy was largely confined to the evangelical fundamentalist Christian subculture, demonstrating the polarizing effect the film had within specific religious communities. So, the response was multifaceted, with critics expressing concerns about the Godmaker's distortion of Mormon beliefs and history, promotion of bigotry and prejudice, and misrepresentative portrayals. But isn't that the key factor we haven't answered yet? 
Is this misrepresentative of Mormon beliefs? Did it misrepresent the faith so much that the church had it banned? There's plenty of peculiar belief by faith scripture in any religion. So did the Godmaker sensationalize the story from the Book of Mormon to push its anti-Mormon narrative? Or is there more to unravel? Now, while Mormon was the popular term for those in that faith, nowadays, since 2018, the church has requested its members be referred to as members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, or more simply, as Latter-day Saints. Why? Well, <laughs> because of everything associated with the polarizing elements of Mormonism. But we'll get to that here in a bit. There is ongoing debate regarding whether Latter-day Saints should be classified as Christians. Some argue that their differing views of post-New Testament Christianity, historical lineage, and open canon of scripture sets them apart. Nevertheless, to define a distinction of the faith, Mormons firmly believe in the restoration of true Christianity and see themselves as part of the Church of Jesus Christ, with priesthood authority restored through Joseph Smith, the Latter-day Saints faith founder. Many people believe Joseph. Dum, 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 dum. If you want more means to distinguish a Latter-day Saint from a Christian, the Articles of Faith, a statement of beliefs composed by Joseph Smith, play a significant role in outlining the core beliefs of Latter-day Saints. This list of 13 points includes beliefs in God, Jesus Christ, and the Holy Ghost. Also, individual accountability for sin, salvation through Christ's atonement, and the first principles and ordinances of the gospel. Now that we have an understanding of the difference, let's talk about the story of Mormons and whether Godmakers was right. Which it kind of was, to a degree. A central narrative in Mormon belief revolves around Elohim, or the Heavenly Father. The concept of exalting once you die and becoming like God in eternity. There's also Jesus Christ's appearance in the Americas after his crucifixion. And all of these teachings were found and passed on by Joseph Smith, who did claim to have received visions from God and Jesus, instructing him not to join any Christian denominational churches, but to translate the Book of Mormon from golden plates he found using seer stones which were revealed to him by an angel named Moroni, to found what he deemed the true gospel and in church, including priesthood authority. That is all detailed in the Book of Latter-day Saints. And it is worth noting that the South Park episode, All About Mormons, also did a highly accurate depiction of the story, with minor discrepancies on specific details that Latter-day Saints point out. It's just that the Book of Mormon says a lot of strange stuff, like that Adam and Eve lived in Jackson County, Missouri. Yes? But school taught me that the first man and woman lived in Africa. Well, you can't believe everything school tells you, Stan. But what about the more hot-button aspects of the Mormon story? Joseph Smith the Martyr, polygamy, getting your own planet, and uh, the curse of the black skin. To go in order, in 1844, Smith announced his candidacy for the presidency of the United States which heightened anti-LDS sentiment. A group of dissenting Latter-day Saints published a newspaper that was highly critical of polygamy and Smith's leadership, prompting Smith to have the press destroyed. This led to charges of treason and conspiracy, and Smith, along with his brother Hiram, were imprisoned in Carthage, Illinois, where they were eventually murdered by a mob. Not as much dying a martyr, but through the skewed bias lens, it's accurate enough. Speaking of polygamy, which Godmakers has a huge problem with, that's another noteworthy aspect of Mormon history. While the LDS Church banned the practice in 1890, it had been widely practiced among Mormons throughout its history. Joseph Smith himself is believed to have had multiple wives, including some who were as young as 14. Although some individuals continue to practice polygamy within the Mormon community today, the church officially does not endorse it. Now, let's address some misconceptions about Mormon beliefs concerning the afterlife. The Latter-day Saints do believe in exaltation. It's clearly prominently featured in their scripture. 
One common misconception brought up is that Mormons believe they will receive their own planets. However, the LDS Church clarifies that this belief is not a literal doctrine, but a caricature created by outsiders. Mormons believe in the potential to become like God in eternity. But, quote, their focus is on the purification and elevation of relationships rather than material possessions, end quote. The concept of exaltation is central to Mormon theology. It refers to a state of eternal progression and becoming more like God. Mormons believe that by following God's commandments and participating in sacred ordinances, they can achieve exaltation and eternal life. The emphasis is placed on the eternal nature of family relationships and the opportunity to be with loved ones in the afterlife. So they don't get their own planet per se, but they do reach a level of godhood and can live happily ever after with the rest of their family and godhood. Okay, now that we've covered all that, time to talk about that curse aspect, because unfortunately, from reading the scripture, that's true too. In the book of Nephi 521, quote, and he had caused the cursing to come upon them, yea, even a sore cursing, because of their iniquity. For behold, they had hardened their hearts against him, that they had become like unto a flint. Wherefore, as they were white and exceedingly fair and delightsome, that they might not be enticing unto my people, the Lord God did cause a skin of blackness to come upon them." End quote. Now, there are people who try to refute the meaning but putting curse and skin of blackness is pretty blatant. And it does go hand in hand with how the LDS church operated in the past, where it had restrictions and teachings regarding people of African descent. Until 1978, black individuals were barred from receiving the priesthood and participating in temple ordinances. Some justifications were offered to explain these policies, but the church has since disavowed them and strives for racial inclusivity and equality. Still doesn't fully make up for the scripture though, like Nephi 521 or Nephi 3060, where it claims that if the bad black people repent, then they too will become white like the good people. Oh, that's uncomfortable. Here's the quote from Nephi 36, quote, And then shall they rejoice, for they shall know it is a blessing unto them for the hand of God, and their scales of darkness shall begin to fall from their eyes, and many generations shall not pass away among them, save they shall be a white and delightsome people, end quote. If you teach everyone on earth to love the white man, you too can join us in white heaven. Oh. Oh. oh, praise white God. It really is that scene from the boondocks. You know, the one with Ruckus and Ronald Reagan. So while beliefs and practices within the LDS church have evolved over time, and the documentary may not have captured the entirety of the beliefs held by contemporary Latter-day Saints, uh, congratulations, the Godmakers. For the time, you weren't entirely inaccurate to the Mormon belief, but you were just sensationalism assholes to the point where no one wanted to listen to you, except for the folks who are already in your circle. The Mormons have many other ways of recruiting members, through door-to-door -door missionaries, visitor centers, through the thousands of church-sponsored Boy Scout troops and educational institutions, and through the Mormon-controlled Marriott Hotel chain, which places Mormon literature in every room. And for all its talk of building an ideal society, Utah, which is 75% Mormon, leads the nation in bankruptcy and stock fraud, and ranks among the highest in divorce, suicide, child abuse, teenage pregnancy, venereal disease, and bigamy. So, did Ed Decker get them? Did he and Jeremiah Films create such a hard-hitting piece that the church had to ban it outright and fought for it to be removed everywhere? <laughs> Did you notice how infrequently I mentioned even the word banned? Despite the rumors and the videos posted on YouTube, the God Makers was not officially banned by the Latter-day Saints or any governing body. The only band me and my team could find was when the LDS church petitioned school districts to ban screenings of the film in high schools and urged newspapers to exercise selectivity in publishing abusive advertisements and readers' letters related to the film. 
These efforts aim to limit the film's reach and prevent its negative portrayal of Mormon beliefs from gaining wider acceptance or influence beyond evangelical Christian circles. So that's as close as it gets to being banned? And I suppose being technically a banned cartoon too? Yeah, it's quite the stretch. It's important to note that while the film faced opposition and attempts to restrict its distribution, it was not officially banned in the sense of legal or governmental censorship. The backlash it received stemmed from the contentious nature of its content and the strong reactions it provoked among Mormons and non-Mormon critics alike. So why does Jeremiah Films slap the word banned on the Godmakers? Even advertising itself as the grandfather of all so-called anti-Mormon films. And for that reason alone, it deserves a viewing. Well, I think we got our answer right there. Banned is being used to sell and profit from the movie to create a sense of controversy and censorship. Giving it a branding of that edgy, controversial anti-Mormon movie. Even the church has banned it. So you should watch it. Uh, sure, Ed Decker, whatever you say. Like, who would do that to promote content? Slapping the word banned over something to get clicks. Oh, uh, <laughs> I see. Uh, shut up. That does not count. Overall, what can we conclude on for this alleged banned Mormon cartoon? Well, Ed Decker and Jeremiah Films produced The Godmakers 2 in 1993 that covered more of its expose into the Church of Latter-day Saints, including accusing the acting head, Gordon B. Hinckley, of consorting with prostitutes and homosexual acts with another man, and also um other stuff with minors. Uh, I wish I could be more specific, but this video would get demonetized, so um, just uh, connect the dots. They also cover the church's other controversies, financial power, polygamy, blood atonement, scripture discrepancies, differences with traditional Christianity, occult symbols, allegations, and control over media portrayal, and its goal of becoming a worldwide Mormon kingdom. The documentary called for repentance, exposing what it presents as controversial aspects of Mormonism. It was also threatened with a lawsuit because of everything listed about Gordon. So, uh, yeah, I don't see Jeremiah Films changing anytime soon. Now, despite the controversy surrounding their works, Jeremiah Films continues to produce controversial content to this very day, aiming to expose what they perceive as corruption, promote traditional values, and present a biblical worldview. And the banned anti-Mormon cartoon from the Godmakers remains a contentious piece of media due to its critique of the Mormon church and is still for sale on their sites, along with their offer to stream their other offensive movies. Yeah, we don't got Netflix, we got this instead. But in the end, was the Godmakers accurate to Mormon beliefs? Were their hit pieces right on the money? I would say yes and no. If we take the testimonials as 100% factual, without any Frankenstein edits or any removal of context, the Mormon faith has beliefs that can be seen as out there and crazy. And the Latter-day Saints Church has had many issues with racist, sexist, bigoted, and frankly, monstrous actions that have caused many people to be hurt. Now, they may be trying to update their image, but that historical truth will always be there. But unfortunately for Godmakers, this expose coming from you with the elevator pitch of Mormons are so crazy and satanic, unlike us, well, it's uh, pretty much the pot calling the kettle black to the fullest extent. If you replace the story of Mormonism with the stories from the Christian Bible, it has the same convincing effect, especially with the controversies, financial power, allegations, and control over media and public office Christianity holds. I think the point was made best in, say, um, Sausage Party. Yeah, I'm, I'm quoting Sausage Party. When Frank the Hot Dog insulted all the other foods and grain beliefs. Thus, no one believed him. Even if The Godmakers was 100% factual, the way it presents that information will never convince anyone other than people who already don't like the Mormon faith and already lean towards the evangelical Christian persuasion. As the hit piece falters on the fallacy that many of the critiques lobbed at it could be flipped right back around at Christianity. That isn't a way to lambast either religion. Because the truth of the matter is any religion can be used for good or cruel actions. 
It really depends on the individual behind it and how they wish to pursue their belief. Really, uh, South Park's All About Mormons is the perfect depiction of the Mormon faith, as it does mock the story of Joseph Smith, depicting how based on mainly one guy's word, an entire religion was founded. But even despite the silly story of their faith, the Mormon family in the episode uses its teaching to be a perfectly healthy family that spreads good to everyone. While The Godmakers really depicts Latter-day Saints as just satanic with no redeeming qualities. Being critical of religion is a good rule of thumb that Decker agreed with as well, especially to avoid people abusing authority that comes with it. But what Decker was doing wasn't being critical of religion. It was using Mormonism as a stepping stone to prop up his own beliefs as moral and right above everything else, especially Mormonism. Maybe us Mormons do believe in crazy stories that make absolutely no sense. And maybe Joseph Smith did make it all up. But I have a great life and a great family. And I have the Book of Mormon to thank for that. The truth is, I don't care if Joseph Smith made it all up. Because what the church teaches now is loving your family, being nice and helping people. And even though people in this town might think that's stupid, I still choose to believe in it. All I ever did was try to be your friend, Stan. But you're so high and mighty you couldn't look past my religion and just be my friend back. You got a lot of growing up to do, buddy. Suck my balls. Damn, that kid is cool, huh?